It's not news that fundamentalist Islam has been a problem in recent decades. I use the term fundamental or radical Islam to distinguish this phenomenon from moderate Islam because the vast majority of Muslims are thoroughly decent human beings. I shouldn't need to point that out, but I do. To make it emphatically clear, I'll still, doubtless, get called an Islamophobe in some quarters, but I can't be held responsible for other people's derangements. So what can you do? I'm not going to spell out the differences between mainstream Islam and fundamental Islam, because if you can't see them, then I can't help you. But suffice to say, their standards diverge from what we might call civilised humanism. They also diverge very sharply from those of the left. Here we have a cult that is a rational, homophobic, misogynistic, racist and wildly intolerant in every conceivable way. Opposition to extremist Islam should have become the great leftist crusade of the day. But instead, terrified of being labelled racist, the left turned to a sort of cowardly cultural relativism that scrambled around to find ways in which all blame could be dumped on the West, or on Israel. It should be a source of enormous shame that instead of becoming the great critic of militant Islam, the left leapt to its defence. Yet it seems instead to be something of a badge of pride. Even when the culture of fundamentalist Islam demands that women cover themselves up, or actually they do deserve to be raped, the left remains silent. Yet it pours scorn on anyone who dares to criticise the niqab as an oppressive garment. These are the women, remember, doomed to never feel the wind in their hair or the sun on their skin once in their entire lives because their husbands bloody say so. And the left, who pour scorn on the culture of 1950s housewives, have nothing at all to say. They scream that some Hollywood starlets get paid as little as $5 million per film, but they're silent over the scores of young women who are stoned to death in Pakistan every year. The damage inflicted by fundamental Islam in recent decades has been incalculable. Millions of decent people have had their lives destroyed by this scourge. But the left doesn't just lack the guts to confront it. They actually make excuses for it. Yet the people who've suffered most at the hands of the fundamentalists have, of course, been Muslims. So for those who excuse this stain on humanity to claim that they care for the Islamic community simply defies logic and rationality. This is the movement that continually made excuses for Mao and Stalin just so that they could blame America and the West for all the strife of the 20th century. And they've proved that they've learned nothing at all. This time, they're painting the US as the great Satan in the new conflict against the terrifying absolutism of fundamentalist Islam. A seminal moment in this story was, of course, 9-11. In the wake of that horror, Andrew Anthony summed up the dilemma facing the modern left over which side to choose. Should they side with the cosmopolitan city of New York, a multiracial city of opportunity, a town where anyone on earth could arrive and thrive, exuberant, cultured, diverse, a place I had visited and loved for its liberty and energy and excitement? Or should they side with the people who attacked it, those arid minds who wanted to remove women from sight, kill homosexuals, banish music, destroy art, the demolishers of the Bamiyan Buddhas who aimed to terrorise everyone they could into submission to the will of their vengeful god. It was, as they say, a no-brainer. Or it should have been, <laughs> but not to the left. Mary Beard, the Cambridge academic, sneered that America had it coming. Edward Said, Oliver Stone and the New Statesman speedily aired excuses for the terror and Seamus Milne and George Galloway moved to publicly condone it just two days after the towers came down. Milne had haughtily suggested that Americans simply don't get it. 
while Galloway gloated that the US had to swallow some of their own medicine. Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11 jumped on the bandwagon and pushed distorted propaganda that garnered a standing ovation from all the foolish lovies at Cannes. At the anti-globalisation European Social Forum at Alexandra Palace in 2004, speaker after speaker praised the resistance of Al-Qaeda. The London Review of Books shared the consensus leftist view that the West was to blame with a slew of articles which, rather like invidious claims on the victims of rape, suggested that the US was asking for it. But while they blamed America and the mainstream media, criticism of the perpetrators or their ideology was markedly absent. Edward Said argued that the image of Islamic extremists was based on highly exaggerated stereotypes and he claimed that the looting and destruction of exhibits in the Iraq National Museum had been a deliberate act of sabotage perpetrated by Americans. Noam Chomsky wrote an entire book blaming the US for the attack. And it was a similar story in Britain in the wake of the 7-7 attacks in 2005, which left over 50 people dead and more than 700 injured. Within days of that atrocity, The Guardian and New Statesman had published apologies for the terrorists from the likes of Dilpazia Aslam and John Pilger. This is the great paradox at the heart of the modern left. It's a movement that must support feminism, that must side with the gay community. But it's also incapable of criticising the ideology most hostile to female emancipation and homosexuality. Fundamentalist Islam. It's the epitome of George Orwell's doublethink. The trick of holding two contradictory beliefs at the same time, while still accepting both. But the left have not just failed to confront radical Islam, they've also mobilised to prevent anyone else from doing so, by loudly damning any critics of the faith as Islamophobes. It's a culture that's become so pervasive that we effectively live under blasphemy laws, which shield the ideology from criticism. The moderate left will only allow a posture in sentimentality about Islam, an insultingly revisionist whitewash that denies any objective appraisal the oxygen of publicity. They've even moved to discredit moderate voices from within Islam itself. Ayan Hirsi Ali is a particular case in point. This terrifically brave woman is one of the most decent, intelligent and perceptive voices on this issue that one could wish for. But in campaigning against the death penalty for apostasy, blasphemy and homosexuality, and in openly resisting female genital mutilation, child marriage and honour killings, she has drawn the ire of the left. When Brandeis University in Massachusetts nominated Ayan for an honorary degree in 2014, a considerable swath of the student body and faculty staff rose up in protest, They accused Ali of promoting hate speech and they forced the university to rescind the offer. In October 2016, the leftist Southern Party Law Centre, the SPLC, an organisation specialising in civil rights legislation against white supremacists, accused Ayan and Majid Nawaz of being anti-Islamic extremists. (laughs) That's right. They're the extremists. Oh, well done. Genius. Dissidents who bravely oppose the jihadists from within the Islamic societies like Azra Namani, Taufik Hamid and Zudi Jassa have all come in for similar treatment. This attitude has affected our universities too. Mariam Namazi escaped Iran in the hope that she and her family would win the freedom of speech to criticise her home nation's regime. But in September 2015... Warwick University banned her from appearing for fear that it may upset Islamic students. Yusuf Kaplan attempted to halt the rising tide of extremism at Westminster University, the institution where both Muhammad and Wazi, the notorious executioner better known as Jihadi John, and Muhammad Jakir Ali, later a suicide bomber in Syria, were both educated. But a huge protest 
largely organised by the School of Oriental and African Studies, mobilised to have him sacked. Emma Fox hoped to talk to Bristol University's Free Speech Society about their troubling history of tolerating extremist speakers, but she too was banned, and the University of the City of London gagged Mayor Gifford, a Briton who had fought bravely with the Kurds against ISIS. The student union claimed that was a very contentious topic, and that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. OK, but the sort of man who regards ISIS as freedom fighters is a deranged lunatic. And shame on you for being so sexist. Yet while banning such figures, British universities have been keen to accept large numbers of deeply troubling fundamentalist speakers. The mental gymnastics necessary to simultaneously hold such conflicting views are extraordinary. And the result is a bewildering array of double standards. An inconsistency made glaringly obvious in the space of a few days in the summer of 2017. It all started with a horrific incident at Charlottesville, Virginia on 12th of August. Amid fighting between rival factions, James Fields, a white supremacist, drove his car at high speed into a crowd of protesters, injuring numerous people and killing 32-year-old Heather Heyer. The outrage and condemnation from the left about the killing and the ideology that informed it was overwhelming, and certainly justified. Yet just five days later, when Yunus Abayakoub drove his car into a crowd of tourists in Barcelona, killing 13 and injuring 130, the silence was deafening. J.K. Rowling, who spent so much time virtue signalling on Twitter that it's a miracle she ever gets any books published, rushed online to post numerous condemnations of Charlottesville and the far right. She also repeatedly chastised Donald Trump for not sufficiently damning the incident, even though he did. Yet just days later, she did not write one critical word about Abba Ghaoud or the belief system that empowered his attack. She merely posted a single comment on how her thoughts were with the victims, and one which bizarrely seemed to celebrate the diversity of those he had run over. When it happened again, in Manhattan on 31st of October, with Saifullah Habalagudic driving his car across the pavement and killing eight while wounding eleven more, Rowling did not see fit to comment at all. But this refusal to criticise Islam can have dreadful consequences. In Britain, it resulted in thousands of young white girls continuing to get raped for years by thuggish gangs of exploitative men from Pakistan and other Islamic countries. Rotherham, Huddersfield, Bolton, Telford, Bradford, Newcastle, Rochdale, Oxford, Derby, Banbury, Peterborough, Burton-on-Trent, Keeley, Halifax, Aylesbury, Blackpool, Manchester, Bristol. It's a list that should shame those in denial, yet they seem immune to doubt. I have a simple message for leftists who want to condemn Western aggression and racist scum like James Fields, but who lack the spine to apply the same judgments on radical Islam. Why not both? Because by sliding back into full hatred of the US, Western Europe and Israel, the most free, progressive and tolerant societies on earth, you have turned a blind eye to some of the vilest people imaginable. As Nick Cohen said, they haven't fully supported Islamists. That would have taken guts. They just looked away. And when others protested, their sole contribution was to say that Westerners had no right to criticise. If you want to support this channel, please like, subscribe and think about buying my books. They're called The Tyranny of the Left and they go into topics like this in much greater detail. They're available on the links below. Please do feel free to pick them up and let me know what you think. Thank you.